Navy from July 1st, 1948 through October 16th, 1948, and he also served in the United States Army in March of 51 through February 50, 1953. This interview is taking place in Hank's home on April 14, 2005 at 7.15 in the evening. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. What is your full name and when and where were you born? My name is Henry Adams, Jr. I was born in Albany, New York on August 5, 1930. And what did you do before you entered the military service? I had uh, elementary and high school education. Graduated from the Albany High School and on June something <laughs> and went into the Navy on July 1st. And did you uh, get drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in the, in the United States Navy. All the, all the, not all, but a lot of the guys were doing it back then. The, uh, College wasn't as big a thing back then in, in my age group as it was as it is today. So a good deal of us, you know, went in, and went into the service. Now, where did you report, and uh, where did you go for your basic training? We started out from a building on North Pearl Street in Albany. I don't know what it is; it's probably not there anymore. And. Um, same and we were sworn in at that point. The same day we uh, took a railroad train and went to Great Lakes, uh, Illinois for basic training, for boot camp. Basic training is in the Army. <laughs> when, we, uh, when we got out there, of course, like all the other uh, recru recruits, about one of the first things they did was shave your hair off. Just got rid of that. And then you went through many lines and you got all your uniforms and a big duffel bag and I won't tell you what they called that. Um, and almost immediately, well actually I got there on, it was on the 2nd of July when I got there. And we really didn't do very much because the 4th of July holiday was coming up. And that was kind of a big thing out at Great Lakes at that time. A lot of music was played. A lot of the uh, recruits that were further along in their training did a lot of uh, uh, drilling and marching. But the day after that, it all broke loose. We just started right into the basic training, um, boot camp, not basic training. And I don't remember how it went as to what you did on what days, but every day in there, we started off with calisthenics or some kind of physical education. And after that, uh, we did many, many things, a lot of close order drilling, a lot of marching. Uh, we had some training in, in firefighting, which I guess is a big thing in the Navy, of course. Um, we did, we had some class work, and I still have someplace a, a manual uh, that was given to us. The old Blue Jackets manual. That was the one, yeah, that was the one. Um, I don't, you know, I honestly don't know. We did some knot tying, I remember that. That was not a big deal. Uh, we did a lot, we did some uh, training in, in uh, firearms. Nothing like the Army. In the Army you get a lot of that. In the Navy they kind of introduce you to a rifle and to a 45 revolver. Um, and that was that. Uh, we, Did you have to qualify as a swimmer? Oh, well now we're, now we're getting down to it. <laughs> yes, you have to qualify as a swimmer. I never did. I'm scared to death of water and why I ever joined the Navy as now hindsight is 2020, I never should have. Um, I had broken arches, so marching was a bad thing for me, and swimming was out of the question. I tried. Um, the very first thing they did to us was stand us up on a platform, and you're all together, 
and tell you to jump off and swim. Well, I jumped off and they pulled me out with a pole. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I never did to this day. I can't swim. I don't want to. The only water I want over my head is a shower. Um, one day, I don't know when it was, it was probably into, um, I can't even remember, what is it, 16 weeks training I think we had? Uh, this was probably into the 14th week of training. I got called out, um, was separated from the company that I was in, and I was put to work in a maintenance office on the other side of the uh, uh, What's the name of it? I can't say the name of the base. Um, at the Great Lakes? Yeah, Lake. Great Lakes. Things don't come always. Mm -hmm. um, and subsequently, uh, I was separated from, or discharged actually, from, from the Navy in, in uh, October. Uh, was given a little pay, which I didn't have much of any coming, I guess, and a ticket to go home. And I came home, and that was that was my Navy experience. It was uh, now you must have uh, pulled KP duties there. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you. And we, what it was like? Uh, yeah, we had uh, the, the Navy was really quite clean at Great Lakes. Um, the mess mess halls were clean. Of course, you kept your own barracks extremely clean. If you didn't, it was some you know. Some of your uh, officers had something to say about that. Um, the big thing was service week. And I remember our company was put on service week, and it was literal. It was a week. It was Sunday morning, and it finished up Saturday evening. Um, I never did so many dishes in my whole life. Uh, I never actually served any food. I was kind of on the cleanup, and uh, they had a, what was it, a grease pit or a grease trap? Fortunately, I never had to clean that, but I saw some of the fellows that did, and I was very thankful I didn't have to do that. Um, one of the things that impressed me, and I guess it probably isn't this way in the military at all, but every Sunday morning you went to church, and you had to go to church. You had no choice in it. You had to have your dress blues on, and you marched to church. And the Catholics went one way, and the Protestants went another way. And I think the Jewish boys actually went on Saturday night. So uh, I don't know whether that's that, that way today or not, but back then, uh, church was a, a weekly affair. Um, I can remember singing the Navy hymn, which was kind of a you know, arousing them in some in some spots. Um, I remember when I worked in the maintenance office at Great Lakes, uh, I'm not sure what my duties really were. We had a commander who was in charge of that, and one of the things I had to do was make coffee constantly. It was always coffee ready to go for anybody that was there or anybody that came in. And I would get in there in the morning at 8 o'clock or 7.30 or whatever it was, and the commander could be seen coming down the street. And you made the coffee according to how he looked in the morning. If he was scowling and didn't look too good, you made it real strong. He had a smile on his face, just a little less strong. <laughs> and uh, other than that, you know, I can't remember what I really did there. I guess I shuffled some papers around. I know I drove a truck and did delivery um, to other parts of, of uh, Great Lakes. And uh, then they, they got it into their head that I really should have a driver's license for the military. And I just never got around to that. And, and first thing you know, I was discharged. Now, do you remember having to go through lifeboat training on on the lake? Thank you for reminding me of that, yeah. Uh, whale boat is what it was. I guess they called them whale boats when I was there. And I can only remember going out once and was petrified because I hate water. And uh, we rowed and 
after a while we got back to shore, and that's the biggest part I remember of that. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, so then the reason for your discharge was? It was, it was medical, med probably. Because of your feet? And yeah, so that and probably because I really wasn't suited for the Navy. Right. I think that was really the answer there all the way. So then when you came home, what did you uh, do then? Well, you had to find a job. I, yeah, I had to find a job. I had many, many jobs between then and 1951. I had uh, two or three civil service jobs. I had taken a test and passed that. And I kept getting letters that there was an opening at this office or that office. Uh, one of the ones I worked at was um, up on Broadway in Albany. It's where the unemployment division was. And what we had to do up there uh, was post unemployment checks to a record. And each morning we'd get a bunch of checks, a pile of checks. It might be maybe, oh, four or five hundred checks. And that was divided up between about a dozen of us. And you could do that almost immediately and then you just kind of looked around. There was nothing else to do, so you, you were told just to make yourself scarce. And then lunchtime came along, and we went to lunch. I think we had a, an hour for lunch. And then there was a smaller group of checks that appeared after lunch. And some of the guys, I swear, never came back after lunch. So, you know, you worked for maybe an hour after lunch posting these checks. And then just kind of, again, stayed out of things and either made yourself look busy or just disappeared. I hated that. That, that was, there was a couple of jobs I had. That was one and both of them were the worst things I've ever done. The other one was down at the uh, Alfred E. e. Smith State Office Building. I worked in the tax department, and I ran an inserting and sealing machine as they, in the mailing part of it. And I liked that. I got into that kind of thing until one day the, uh, the chief called me in and he said, look, he said, you're doing a fine job, a great job as a matter of fact. You've got to slow down. You're making a lot of people look bad here. <laughs> I only stayed in that for another week or so. I decided I, that wasn't for me. I'd find something else to do. I worked for uh, the Loudon Machinery Company, which was also up on Broadway. It was a company that dealt in uh, things for cow barns, stanchions and stalls and piping. And uh, that was kind of a, it keeps you busy. It was a lot to do. One of the things we had to do was unload gondola cars that were full of pipe. Now there was a challenge because Wherever this came from, they just poured oil all over these pipes. Very slippery, very dangerous, and you had to get in there and unload those. That happened, oh, I don't know how long I even worked there. It was a while, and, and about once every two weeks we'd get a gondola car or two of pipe. Um, they had to paint that pipe after it was all cleaned off. You dipped it into a, a big trough, and hung it up on a, uh, I don't know what it was, uh, a, a, a pipe type of thing with wheels. You hung your, your uh, pipes up there and then it went through a drying process and that just pushed it on into the dryer and the next day you took it out of there. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed there was I got to know the draftsman who worked up in the office. And at one point, things were not very busy out in the warehouse. There wasn't many orders to fill. And uh, they let me go up there. And I got to know this man pretty well. And he taught me a little bit of drafting. I don't know whether, I probably don't have any of those left around here. But years ago, I had a few that I had done. And it was uh, drafting of cow barns and showing the layout and uh, where the stanchions would be placed or other stalls, actually. And uh, that, I was not given the opportunity to go very far with that. 
uh, because we got busy again outside and he went back to that. But I enjoyed mm -hmm. drafting. That, that, I, I like that. Um, after I left there, I'm not sure where I went. I had many jobs uh, during mm -hmm. that time. Uh, and then, of course, we got up into uh, uh, 1951, and uh, there was that day when the letter came. It said, we want you, Uncle Sam wants you to report on such and such a day to such and such a place um, for a physical. And I and several hundred other guys went back to the building on Broadway, um, and there was a whole bunch of civilian doctors. One of them happened to be our doctor. His name was Dr. A. N. Bick. Uh, he was a he was a lovely man. We uh, he treated my family and and uh, he brought our kids into the world after a time. And we stayed with him many years. He was an interesting man. He uh, he came over to this country in 1930. <coughs> nine. And he had been in Salzburg, Austria, and he was head of a hospital over there. And he could see the handwriting on the on the wall with Hitler. And, and I guess he had actually started invasions back in 38, if I remember right. But he was able to get himself and his family and all his family out of out of Austria and brought him over to the United States and bought out a practice there. and, and uh, as I said, he treated us for many years until he died. Um, the first place I went when I was drafted in the Army was to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And that was just a very brief stop. We were there maybe two or three days, and you got uniforms, and, and they fed you a little bit, and you cleaned some barracks, and then they put, put us on a train, and we headed down to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And that too was a fairly short stopover. I think it was about a week. And we boarded trains again and we went down to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia. Uh, and there is, I stayed there for basic training and all right until uh, October of 51 when we were sent to Germany. What actually happened to us was we're, we're in the Korean uh, time period now, and it was a lot of draftees, as, as which is what I was, uh, that went to Korea, had their training, and went there. Uh, I guess the Lord was looking over me at the time, because uh, they had activated the 43rd Division, which was the Vermont National Guard, and they had sent them down to Camp Pickett, New Jer uh, Camp Pickett Virginia. And they were way under strength, of course. So they used draftees to bring them up to proper strength. And then uh, we had our, our training there. Um, they were, you know, kind of the, the hometown boys, every one of them. Uh, but they, uh, they were good to us, and they gave us some good training. And then uh, I guess we were given a week's leave, if I remember right, we came home and then went back and broke up the camp and packed everything and got on uh, boats and headed for Germany. The boat I was on was the uh, General S.D. Sturgis. Well, now here we are on water again. You know what I think about water. It's not much. Um, but actually it was quite a nice voyage. It took 13 days to go from Hampton Roads, Virginia into uh, yeah, I can't say the name in Germany. Bremerhaven? Bremerhaven, yes. It was Bremerhaven, Germany. And uh, it was a smooth trip. We used to uh, get up at nights and we'd watch right at the bow and you could see the dolphins swimming alongside and, and there was a, it was all phosphorescent in the water. They would dive across the, the bow of the ship. And uh, other than that, you had a little watch duty or a little guard duty. Uh, I never had to do any KP while I was on the boat. And we got into uh, Germany. And we made our way over the course of about two or three days to uh, Munich, Germany. 
And we were, uh, I didn't know that then, but we, uh, the treaty with the Germans had not been signed legally yet. War had ceased, but um, we were occupation forces is what we were in Germany. And again, here we are, a lot of physical education every morning, a lot of calisthenics, um, a lot of uh, alerts. Alerts were a big thing. Um, they happened frequently. And sometimes you actually move right out of the, the barracks. It was called a concern. Warner Cassern was the name of it. And uh, sometimes you packed everything up and moved right on out uh, to a training area, Hohenfels or Grafenwar mm -hmm. or something like that. Other times you just got on the on the trucks and got off the trucks and put everything back and that was the extent of it. Um, all of this, of course, uh, in all training and in the ongoing training in the Army is really geared towards making teamwork. Um, and I guess they succeeded pretty good. Uh, here again, we were very fortunate because even though we were occupation forces, you wouldn't know it. We got passes on the weekend and we could go into Munich and, and uh, uh, I found a little bar and tavern neighborhood one that my buddy and I got to know the people in there. So we used to go there. It was a man and his wife and their little daughter and they liked us and we liked them. Uh, I saw a lot of, of Munich um, uh, in what is there, in downtown Munich, there's a thing called the Glockenspiel. Yes. You know the Glockenspiel? That is a magnificent thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got over there, I expected to see wreckage all over the place, because we weren't that far after the cessation, cessation of hostilities, which was in 45. And this was 51, six years later. In Munich, uh, it had been about 85% level to the ground, and you'd never know that. I saw one, one building in Munich that had been bombed out, and it was left as a, as a museum uh, to, to the war. Uh, we used to find a few things laying on the ground out in the, in the training areas. Found a, one of the guys found a German helmet one time with a spike on top of it. And, and, but, you know, I expected to see burned out trucks and vehicles and tanks, none of that. However, we were in the American zone of Germany. Um, I understand in the French zone and the English zone, they didn't have the money to put into the economy to build it back up as fast as we did. And uh, there was a lot of that laying around there, I guess, still six years after the war. Uh, it's at that time that the Americans had the Marshall Plan in effect, uh, where they were pouring lots of money in. Did you see any uh, evidence of uh, the construction and rebuilding going on while you were there? Not in Munich itself. There was some on the outlying areas. Uh, we went through some other cities occasionally where we were going someplace, and you could see there was some uh, construction going on. But I'll tell you the truth, most, most all the parts of Germany that I saw, which was in, in Bavaria, um, it was everyday life as we know it today. Mm. People went to work, they bought newspapers, and they worked in restaurants, and restaurants was a big thing in Munich. We used to go into one in, in uh, it was some Keller, I can't remember just what it, the name of it was now. And you could go in there and you'd get a, a filet mignon with a fried egg perched on top of it, some potatoes, uh, a beverage, usually coffee, although you could pay and have, have beer. Um, and it was 75 or 75 cents, three marks. And, and the steak was out of this world. It was just delicious. Um, we spent some time, some time there. Um, we went one time, I remember we were going to uh, Grafenwar, 
and we were we were driving on the on the uh, autobahn, and we stopped for a, a rest stop along the way, and all the trucks were kind of pulled up close to each other, and there was a, there was a space in front of our truck of maybe 25 or 30 feet before the next one, and all of a sudden one guy yelled, "Watch out, duck!" And there was a car that had come down the other way on the autobahn. And he had lost control and he came across it and right straight in front of our truck and off a little small cliff and down into the bottom there. Um, I don't know whether he was hurt or not, but some of the medics went down to take check him out, you know. Um, that was a close call. Were you actually, uh, did you st uh, stay on the base at Graffenweir? No. And see, I happened to stay, I had been stationed over there and the barracks there still had uh, the emblems uh, on the entrances as you came in, uh, the Nazi swastika. Is that right? And uh, the, you could see the evidence of the Allies uh, strafing uh, the barracks because of all the bullet holes oh, really? in there. And I never so. saw that because we we stayed uh, we'd set up a tent city out wherever it was and, and stay in the tent city and and uh, that was all there was to that. We did a lot of. Uh, training. We had a lot of, um, I remember one time they wanted us to see what a, uh, the power of a tank battalion. And we had marched, I think, 15, 20 miles the night before. We were all dead tired. And they pulled up this tank battalion, which I think is five tanks, as I remember. And they cut loose onto a, a firing range with everything they had, the machine guns, the big guns, and um, it was impressive, but we were so tired. I can remember I was sitting with my back up to a tree, and I slept through part of it. <laughs> very tired, very tired. Didn't need ear, um, earplugs or anything. I no, <laughs> and it was loud. <laughs> Did you ever get called up uh, with the tank units to the Fulda Gap there, the the invasion route, where traditional invasion route to? Uh, where the Russians and other uh, no. enemy troops used to come down through there. Yeah, no, we never were involved with that at all. Um, I guess uh, we were fortunate, as I said before. We could have been in Korea, where a lot of the guys lost their lives. It was terrible. But we were able to get to London on leave at one point in time. We had uh, eight days in, in London. Um, we got to Paris, France, Salzburg, Austria. So I really got to see a little bit of the, the countries around there. Um, I remember one time we were going to London and my buddy and I and Joe something, I can't remember his name. Um, we ended up in Rhine Main Air Force Base and we got a hop to Prestwick, Prestwick, Scotland on a mail plane. It was an old C-47 two-engine two plane and we got in there and, and there was a pilot and a co-pilot and all you could see, there was no seats, it was just a sea of mail bags and we uh, took off and I don't think we were ever more than 5,000 feet in the air but we were high enough that you knew you were up there. And we got to Prestwick, Prestwick, Scotland, and the pilot decided he'd land, got his clearance or whatever they did back in those days. And he went from 5,000 feet to the ground in minutes. And boy, I'll tell you, did the ears hurt. That really was an experience I don't care to ever have again. Then we took a train into London and stayed there for a while. Um, while I was in Germany, one of the things I saw uh, was Dachau, the concentration camp. <clears throat> I know I have a, a publication that I brought home from there. And that made you sit right up and take notice. You know, We had seen a lot of newsreels back here before I was in the uh, in the army and we all knew what was going on but when you walked in there and, and at this time it was then uh, 
a museum type of thing. But the ovens were there, um, the guards, uh, parapets or whatever they were up on were there, uh, barbed wire all over the place. And there was, away from the ovens, there was definitely mounds of, uh, in the ground. One of them, I remember, said uh, uh, simply, grave, grave of thousands unknown. That made a pretty big impression on me. Uh, I had never seen anything like that before, and, and uh, it was all quiet there, even though there was a lot of people visiting. It was very quiet. Uh, if people were talking, they were doing it very low. And uh, not only military people there, there was a lot of civilians there, too. I say a lot. There may have been, you know, 100 people there or something. And this is a very large area. So it were never crowded or anything. Uh, that was maybe the single thing that made more of an impression on me in the Army than anything else, I think. Uh, now, did you uh, have to have undergo regular weapons training, uh, drills, um, extra kinds of duties uh, for periods of time where you thought it would never end? Uh, we did a lot of uh, duty in, in weapons training. Uh, we'd go to, fairly regularly, we would go to a rifle range. And um, some of the guys, of course, qualified as expert and all of that sort of thing. I don't know, I never knew anybody in our company that did. or. Um, but we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, I guess just to get you, you know, very comfortable with this weapon that you had in your hands. And you had that with you all the time, even though seldom was ever loaded with ammunition. But you carried it with you all the time. How long did it take you to get uh, familiar and comfortable with your weapon that you could uh, disassemble and reassemble it uh, in a designated period of time? Fairly soon. <laughs> Because you had to do it very quickly, and, and uh, I think I stumbled with it for a while, but within a week or two, I had that down pretty pat. Um, the big thing was the weapons we had were M1 rifles. They were eight or nine pounds, very heavy, and we did, did uh, uh, training with those and had to hold the rifle out like this for a period of time. You knew you had eight or nine pounds in your hand. Um, our, uh, our officers were very big on the cleanliness of the weapons. And I happened to have one, as did other fellows too, that the rifling in there was just almost shot and there was no way you could get the barrel of that, inside of that barrel clean. Uh, at least not to satisfy anybody. Uh, so you'd have to go clean it again and bring it back, and, and there it was, about the same, you know. And they'd finally give up on you, but uh, that may be a reason that I never did very well on the rifle range either, because uh, if the rifling isn't good, your shot isn't going to go true, and uh, and I never, as I said, I never qualified for that. But you get comfortable with it after a while. How were the meals and paydays uh, that you experienced while you were in the Army? The meals were, when we were at the Caserne, the meals were excellent. I'll never forget the first breakfast we had over there. Uh, we were in a five-story building, and it was, it was in the shape of a U. We were in one part of that U. All the cooking was done down in the basement of the building, and it was brought up on dumbwaiters to each company mess hall. And there was tables in there, four chairs at each table. And the first morning we went in there, on every table it was two liter bottles of milk. And we hadn't seen milk in a bottle in a long, long time. Uh, never saw that at, at Camp Pickett. Uh, but uh, the meals in there were, were excellent. Uh, 
it got to a point where our company um, mess hall people actually cooked for our company only. And we had to pull KP and go down to the basement. Well, I, yeah, actually we didn't do that. If you helped the cooks, you went down to the, to the basement. If you uh, had KP, normal KP of cleaning up and dishes and all, it was done in your own mess hall. And we had at one end of it, there was big, I guess, stainless tubs um, that, you, that you got everything cleaned up there. And um, Now, it was a different story when you were out in the field. Um, again, your, your company people did your own cooking for your company. I, can, I remember one meal out there. It was in an absolute downpour, a terrible rainstorm. And the cooks set up there and they had the, the serving trays and, and you went through that and you had your mess kit and your, your uh, cup and they would quickly open this up and they'd put something in there. I remember my, when they put peas in there, they were floating because I was full of water. So you'd have to take it and kind of pour the water out and then you get some mashed potatoes and whatever else it was and try and find a place and, and uh, hold this kind of under your poncho so you could try and eat. Uh, that wasn't a very good meal. It wasn't a very good experience either because of all mud wherever we were. And you never did like that sort of thing. Did you ever experience uh, having to eat uh, seed rations and meals of that kind? For a short period of time, yes. What uh, were they like? You know, they weren't too bad. What kind of food did they have in these rations? They had um, they had small cans. I know there was uh, there was fruit in some of them, and of course everybody had his own can opener. Uh, they were a little can about this big, about that big around. Um, things like uh, spaghetti was was one of the things. I don't I can't remember the main entrees. I know there was there was biscuits in some and and salt and pepper, and, and uh, they didn't taste too bad. We got to a point where we'd find the closest truck, and you'd wire uh, this little tin to the block of the truck when it was nice and hot, and then before the truck left, you'd get it off of there, and you had kind of a hot meal, which was all right. Um, did you ever get spam? No, I never did. No. Closest thing I ever had to that was in the Navy, and uh, we got that every once in a while there. Um, somewhere along here, um, we I think we went to uh, Hohenfels at one time for training, and this training consisted of uh, maybe it's a little something like you said I don't know. Uh, a tank battalion would go ahead of you and you'd follow it and uh, there, would, there would be uh, an artillery pieces back behind you someplace that would fire and I never realized that you could actually watch a projectile go through the air. You could hear it coming and I mean you can't watch a bullet out of a rifle. That's too fast but an artillery shell you can actually see it go over your head and then it'll explode up there after a little bit. Um, that, that was kind of interesting. I, uh, I, a lot of this I never enjoyed, but you tolerated some. And some of the things like that I tolerated better than others. I remember we went through an a infiltration course at one point in time. And it was on a, on a slope of land that went like this. And you started out down there, and you were crawling through this, holding your rifle, going under bob wire with live machine guns up in the front here, firing. And you could tell they were because you could see the tracer shells, at least at night you could. And you were told never to put your head up. Well, there was no question of you're never going to put your head up. And you got through there, and you'd get up to the end, and you were very close to the machine guns at that point in time. I don't know. 100 feet, maybe something like that. And you got to the end and then it dropped off and you just kind of roll down to the bottom and 
go off to the sides and know that you've been, at least for me, the closest thing to any combat that I ever saw was, was on an infiltration course. Um, I, I didn't like that. What about payday? Did you ever have, how would it differ from, uh, say, the Navy? I know you didn't spend that much time with the Navy, but did you have to pull armed guard duty at any time when they had payroll distribution? No, no, not at all. <clears throat> the uh, paymaster would come to our company area and he'd, he'd set up a table in, in the mess hall and he had, he had the money there. We were paid in script, not in dollars. And you'd just go through, they'd call the name, you'd go through the line and you'd get your, your monthly pay. I think, I, I guess I was a PFC at that point, I think it was $110 a month. And, uh, and that's all you had for the month. A lot of guys didn't have that, particularly the married guys, because they had allotments taken out, they were sent home to their families, and they'd only have a few dollars uh, to spend for the month. Um, at some point here, I went to, um, what was it, the Eagle's Nest that was Hitler's, Hitler's. in Berchtesgaden, Germany. And we went up in that area and we saw a number of things. Um, I'm not sure all of these were in the same place. We went to Garmisch and we went to Berchtesgaden. Uh, we saw King Ludwig's castle at one point, which was quite interesting. Um, I remember one time, uh, fr my friend's name was Pro. He was Marion Bush James, and his father had been in the service all his life. And this, they called him Pro because he, he talked like a professor and the guys didn't like him. But he, uh, he and I went up and we went skiing at uh, Grafenmoor, maybe it was, I don't know. It was a it was a Saturday or a Sunday. It was kind of in the late winter. And we got some skis and we, we skied down to a little bench there. And there was a rope toe up there. Well, I couldn't get on that rope toe to save my neck. So I turned around and skied back to this skied. That's using the term loosely, I'm sure. Anyway, the skis went across and I went that way and I thought I'd broken my leg. Turned out I hadn't, but I'd sprained it terribly bad. And I ended up, uh, that was in Austria, come to think of it. I ended up in a hospital in Salzburg, Austria for almost a month. And then when I went back to duty, I was still on crutches. We got back to the Caserne in Munich. And uh, they kind of really didn't want me there because I was on crutches. So they kind of said, you know, you do this, you do that. Well, some way I found out there was an opening in the personnel office and I applied for it. And that got me out of Company F and got me into service company, which is where I spent the rest of my time in the service, in service company. I was the uh, 3rd Battalion clerk, I think, something like that. And this was a whole different world. You know, we had all of the personnel records there uh, of uh, non-coms and enlisted and, and officers. And you were responsible for those. And when there was an alert, those had to go with you. You packed them all up and, and your typewriter and everything went. And the main reason I got the job was I knew how to type. And I wasn't terribly tremendous with it, but I knew how to type and do it accurately. You know, two or three fingers. Um, and that's where I stayed until um, until I got out of the service. Um, at one point, I forget, this must have been about in January of 1952, just before I came home. Uh, one of the guys had, for, however, he had found out that you didn't have to come home on a uh, troop carrier. If you wanted to pay your way home, you could do that. Well, seven of us decided we were going to pay our way home. This would be a big deal. And 
because that little time I had in the Navy qualified me for the right time, I was the only one that was allowed to do it. And I got my papers and I went from uh, um, Munich on a train, 14 hours I think, to Paris, France. And uh, that's another story. When you go someplace on a train and you cross from one country to another, the you would stop and oh, we'll say German officials got on there and they would go through and they would check everything. Every person had to open their bags and take their coats off and they'd go through the pockets and all. Then they'd find a GI there and they'd just look at our papers and we could have had anything in the world. They treated us completely different. And then the train would start up. That, you were there probably an hour and a half, two hours. Then the train would start up. You'd go a few hundred yards and stop. And the other country's officials would get on and you'd go through the whole thing all over again. Uh, that was kind of a shame. I, I felt sorry for the, the Germans. Uh, the, I found that the German people themselves were really nice people. Um, the Nazis, I guess, and that clan and so forth weren't so nice. But the actual Germans, the everyday Germans that you met were nice people. Um, and I hated to see them, them being put through all of this every time they, they go someplace. What was your reaction when you saw Paris? <clears throat> My first reaction to Paris, um, we got off the train, and the first thing I could, could smell was perfume. And I didn't know it was perfume, it just smelled kind of good. And apparently, a lot of the perfume outfits over there, Chanel and others, would actually turn some of this loose in the air in the railroad stations, so that, you know, you're here, go buy some Chanel and send it home to your bride. <laughs> um, Paris, I thought, was dirty. Um, there was a lot to do and a lot to see. We took a tour called Paris by Night, and we went to uh, two or three nightclubs and the Fathers Bergere. Um, and those people, all they wanted was your money. Uh, that it was very obvious that they were not social and all. If they were singing, they were happy and glad. The minute they were stopped singing, well, that was it. Um, the people in Paris, I remember Pro and I went one day, there's a, I can't tell you the name of it, there's a big white building up on a, on a hill. I, Church? Yeah, it's a church. Sacred. Sacred Heart? I suppose that's yeah, it. We decided we wanted to go there, and we decided we'd walk. Well, we didn't realize we were about four miles away. And we walked and walked. We never did get there. Um, and we were in a, a part of Paris called Clichy, I think it was. And the people there were not very nice people. They did not like American, particularly American GIs didn't like us at all. And I can remember we were walking down a, a street and there was two or three coming toward us. So we crossed to the other side of the street. So did they. And we never had a confrontation with them. <clears throat> but it was a very, very unnerving time. Um, I found that true in London too. That the British, at that point at least, they did not like GIs. Uh, their GIs weren't paid anywhere near what we were paid, and they were very jealous of that. And if you went into a small pub or something like that, um, you wanted to have four or five guys with you. And they kind of jeered, and, and it was just a whole different way of life that I'd never experienced before, and thank God haven't since. <coughs> So then when did you um, arrive in the States? How long was your trip? You flew back from Paris? No, I, I came back on the Ile de France. Oh. Came out of La Havre, France. Oh. It cost $175. And 
this is kind of a funny story. Um, the first night out, there was I knew I was had been introduced to three or four girls there that were the wives of some of the guys, and they were coming home that way. And we were up in the in the pub, and had a glass of beer, and and I said to one of the servers there, I said, this is absolutely amazing. They feel no motion to this ship. It's beautiful. He said, sir, we've been docked in South Hamplin for the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> and from there on, it was pure hell. Um, we were, we got through a, we were up in the North Atlantic in the, in the winter. This was February. And the first morning out, I remember I went up to a glass enclosed deck on on the ship, and I looked out and all I could see was water. And pretty soon I realized that the water was there and the water was there and it was there. We were down in the trough of me. I don't know how big the wave was. I always told a story that it was 60 feet. I don't know that. But then all of a sudden you went down and, and you were up and you could see that it went up and you could see the sky again. Well, I got nauseated and it took six days to come across the ocean and I didn't eat one meal and I didn't leave my bunk for six days. Just before the, one day, one of the girls came in with an orange and she said, you haven't eaten, you've got to eat something and hand me this orange. Thought I was going to die. So that was not a good experience coming home. Uh, one of the things I got to tell you about, after I was home and married, I met a, a, some very close friends by the name of Schultes. And Alan had gone over to Germany in 1954. And we got talking one night and I told him I'd gone over on the General S.D. Sturgis. And he said, uh, you know, you no, know, he said, I went over on the General S.D. Sturgis. And I said, well, so did I. What'd you think of it? He said, I didn't think much of it. And come to find out, they got off at uh, Bremerhaven and they, before a return trip, they anchored the, the boat out and a ways out. Its uh, boilers blew up and it sank right there in Bremerhaven Harbor. And, you know, I was very fortunate going over. Alan was very fortunate going over. But to this day, I guess that ship is on the bottom of the harbor over there. So. So then when you got home, you had to get another job? Or? Yeah, I, uh, I went to work for General Mutual Insurance Company on Broadway in Albany. And um, I stayed there for quite a while. In fact, after I met Louise and, and married her, um, I worked for them till like 1960, I, I think. 57, maybe it was, 57. And um, I got into data processing. Now, this is back in the days of the punch cards and sorting machines and the tabulators and all of that. And I guess I found my niche there because I really liked that. And I, I worked there. Uh, and then I went to uh, Dorn's Transportation over in Rensselaer and uh, kind of headed up there data processing operation for a while. And then a little later on I went to um, Dorn's Transportation, or um, Mobile Oil, and worked for them for a while. And then uh, I saw an ad for Farm Family Insurance, which at that time was out in Del Mar. And uh, I applied for that job and got it and, and worked for him 30 years till I retired. Uh, first computer I ever saw was in our company. It was a, a 305 Ramac and it was still with cards, but it was on, di the cards were fed into a reader and went on disk. And uh, so I, I learned that and I, after a while I, you know, I learned some programming and, and uh, uh, went a long way. Uh, did that for uh, 17 years, maybe, and uh, then the last period of time I, I was in office management. I was the manager of office services there and, 
And uh, right now there's a big glass building down on 9W, which is where at the end of Bender Lane. Uh, the last couple of years I was there, that was my project. I was the liaison between the builder and the architect and management of the company. And uh, then I retired from that. Mm -hmm. And that was that. So I take it you said you're not in touch with any of your buddies? or I stayed in touch with uh, Joe Mascarelli for some years and uh, for uh, Pro James. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, he visited here at one time, and uh, then he married a, um, I guess he brought his family with him. He married a girl who had two daughters, and he came here and visited, and um, we, we all went up to the Aldemont Fair together, and mm -hmm. he left, and uh, two, three years later, the Christmas card stopped coming, and I never heard from him. I had no way to look him up. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that he's dead because uh, he and I were very close friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very close mm -hmm. as you can get in the service, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I don't. I haven't. Uh, I've never seen any reunions or anything. And I've never Not gone to any that. Of the military organizations. No, or anything. Mm -hmm. no. Once I got out of the military, I knew the military wasn't for me, and I didn't mm -hmm. want any more of it. So, unlike a lot of, I have a very Another friend of mine was in a, on a destroyer in the Navy. I visited him one time at Norfolk, Virginia on his ship. Got to see the Missouri, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. went on that. But um, he, he, to this day, goes to reunions of whatever mm -hmm. the destroyer group is. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I never got into that at all. Okay, well, thank you very much for visiting with us mm -hmm. about your military life. You're welcome indeed.